So, um, so today we're going to talk about sort of the the job development piece, and and because job development, I mean, we could easily spend a week, you know, just talking about job development strategies and the whole negotiation thing. And one of the reasons why I wanted to to not so much do a a, a a webinar on actual negotiation, but to talk about the fact that in customized employment, the idea is that the job is not an off-the-rack job, that there's no job description for it. Um, in particular, what we're doing is, is kind of unbundling a job description a lot of the times, pulling out tasks and, and utilizing the skills that your that that your job candidate has, and then sort of rebundling in, into a new package, um, you know. And in the past, we talked about the fact that that you know we we tend to concentrate in our work on smaller companies. Uh, we were out this morning uh, at a manufacturing company that probably has about oh three or four hundred employees. Um, that's not what most of us would consider small, but in the realm of the world, that's a small business. It's not. It's not IBM with you know seventy five thousand employees and, and and things like that. So um, so a company like that does have job descriptions, but even in the smallest companies that don't have formal or written job descriptions, still the boss or the manager um, they they have an idea in their brain of what every position should be doing. Um, and so, so whether you're formally using a negotiated strategy to unbundle, or if you want to call it job carving or job creation or job restructuring or job sculpting, as they say in some industries these days, um, basically that's the negotiation that we're talking about. And again, I'm not going to really talk about you know win-win negotiation and win-lose negotiation and 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 the compromises and and that kind of stuff. I'm going to talk more about the fact that job development under a customized approach is a negotiation. Uh, you know, and, and again, it's, it's different than when most of us get a job, we negotiate our salary and we negotiate our, our working conditions and stuff like that. So we all have some level of negotiation. Um, but, but this is a more intensive, this is a more, you know, how do we, how do we put something new uh, together through, through uh, you know, sort of the deconstruction and the reconstruction of a business. Um, we were just commenting this morning when I loaded this up that uh, Adobe has decided to change all of my bullets to number fours. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure what that's about, but uh, uh, it, 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 these are all, yes, these are all point number four. So on a scale of one to ten, this is, these are all fours. Um, so I don't, maybe, maybe we can figure this out later. So, so when we're talking about customized job development, I, I want to lay out, and I know that some of you already know this because you've been hanging with us for a while, but, you know, we've had people coming and going and, and and so I want to you know sort of reframe uh, job development again and and again hear me say that that this is one approach to job development we don't use this for everybody that we work with because we we you we work cross disability we might be working with you know uh, an Afghanistan you know veteran. Uh, who has returned uh, to the states, you know, with a physical disability or a psychiatric disability or something, with with a prior work history, and so it, we're going to approach that person and job development of that person differently than say somebody who's just come through special education uh, and maybe is on the autism spectrum or has an intellectual disability or something like that. So um, the, the other piece here too is I want to leave enough time at the end. Um, for for questions, and I, I very rarely do that, so I'm going to really try hard today to do that. Uh, no promises, though, because once I get wound up, I, I get going. So, um, and there's a fair amount of material here, even though we're taking a small bite out of all the material. Um, so, so in framing this, you know, again, I, I always fall back on on what we call the myth of the labor market. Um, there's a lot of money that goes into studying the labor market, and some of it makes sense from a prediction standpoint and from an economic standpoint. And you know, folks need to know what are the growth industries and and where's the world economy going and all that stuff. I would say for us, it's less a concern because we're not on the business side of the equation. We're on the supply side, right? We're we're on the 
we're we're on the actual labor part of it. We're not on the market side of this. And because we start with the individual and and we're so framed, you know, everything we do is so framed by the individual that it really doesn't matter what the growth industries are. We're not looking for, you know, advertisements anymore. We're not looking for who's hiring. We're looking for a way that again we negotiate a job in a place of employment that matches the person's skills and the tasks that they can do and their you know their their working conditions what are their what are their ideal conditions of employment so it's a different way of looking at things and and when you start out doing this this has been this has been one of the things that we've had to work through a lot with say vocational rehabilitation agencies and most of them get it um, you know from from a rehab act perspective where it says start with the person and work outward uh, not necessarily in those words but that but that's how it's interpreted um, I think this works very well I think that what we've seen is you know and and this would apply for the general population as well when we start with the industry and we push people into it it's it's almost bound to fail even though we're very very you know, adaptable in our lives to work. In fact, most college graduates don't don't work in the area that that they studied in America. Um, all the same, you know, we do tend to move towards jobs, at least in our careers, that make sense for who we are or who we've become over time. So. Um, you know, this idea of, oh, the computer industry is hiring, therefore we should go get everybody jobs in computers, is really backwards. Don't start with the industry, start with the person. And then it's a negotiation. The other piece is, is then we talked about this before too, is are we actually job developing or are we job finding? And so much of what passes for job development is actually job finding, going in, asking employers if they're hiring, and then hoping that there's a match for it. We don't really do it that way. We don't ask people whether they're hiring or not, because one of the things that we know is that employers are almost always hiring. They're hiring a person who can generate revenue, right, who can do the work, do it at a profitable rate, right, so that the owner of the company gets a profit so that they can pay their mortgage and, and have a salary as well, um, <clears throat> rather than, you know, just, just sort of, you know, uh, 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 assuming that that we can go in and find you know the perfect match in a, in a business and and they just happen to be hiring so we don't you know we're really doing job development not not finding jobs um, <clears throat> the other piece here and and the substance of this and this gets into employer engagement and a lot of other issues um, is that our we recognize that our communities are rich with social and economic capital and and by that I mean that you know, the, the predominant way that, that people get jobs is through who they know, uh, through the networking strategies. And, and it, it, a lot of folks, after they've been in their career for a while, realize that even though, even though very formal hiring processes uh, exist in a lot of companies or in government or, or wherever, a lot of times it's still the fact that somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who was hiring and said a good word or got them connected up with their cousin or their uncle or their brother or their sister or whatever and got them hired. And the other people who applied, well, they had to go through the process just to learn that they didn't get the job. We know that that may not be fair, but it is the way that the world works. And it's, you know, it's the politics of, of employment. And so, you know, if, if we're going to play that game, if we're going to play in that market, then we need to be leveraging our social and economic capital as well. And, so hopefully we'll have a little time to talk about that. And we have formal processes of employer engagement as well, some of which we're doing in, in Utah uh, and some that we're doing around the country uh, and have been for a long time. Uh, again, I, I stated that employers are almost hiring, uh, almost always hiring, that they are. And, and again, it's, it's, you know, whether they're advertising or not, most jobs never get hired. I've, I've read statistics as high as 93% of jobs are never advertised in the open market. Um, but be that as it may, employers are looking for opportunities generally to increase their market share, to increase their profitability. So, um, you know, we're, we're always open to that as business owners, as long as you sort of match our values and the things that, that we need to do. Um, 
So we also allow discovery in our process to drive employment development. We don't start out talking about, well, I wonder what job would be great for Greg, right? What we do is we allow the process to tell us the information that we need to know about, about Greg. Where is he going to fit best? What, what sort of corporate culture is going to fit him best? What, uh, what skills and tasks does he bring uh, to the to the to the process, um, you know, what are the work hours? What are those conditions of employment that are going to fit him best? Rather than sitting around and going, boy, he really likes bowling. Maybe we should go to a bowling alley. Um, you know, a lot of times the things that people do in their lives, especially the more significant this, this, the disability, the less choice they had in doing them. And when you ask somebody, well, do you like this? 90% of the time you're going to hear, yes, I like this. Um, it's one of the few things that I get to do, or it's the thing that's within my control. But there are a lot of things that all of us like to do, too, but we don't necessarily want to make a living at those things. So what I would say is when you're asking people with very little life experience and very little choice and self-determination, don't ask those questions. Instead, you know, let the discovery process lead you this is why it's called discovery, lead you to the answers or to at least to good hunches about places that, that the person would fit and the things that, that they would do and, and, and do well and like to do you know, over and over again um, you know, as in a job. Um, we don't talk about dream jobs anymore because dream jobs don't really make sense when you start talking about them. We don't ask people what their dream jobs are. I have in the past and I realize I was wrong. Um, dream jobs are kind of a setup for job developers. First of all, I, I you know, I, if, if Tim comes in and says that, you know, he wants to be the, the quarterback for the, you know, for the, the, the Oakland Raiders, you, you know, that's great. That, but I, you know, I'm not that good a job developer. I, I, you know, usually those jobs go to quarterbacks. They go to somebody who plays football and has a career of sorts. Um, it, you know, so it's an automatic setup. It's automatically you got to backpedal and you got to say, oh, I, I didn't mean your real dream job. I meant, you know, a dream job that I was capable of helping you get. Um, the other piece is that we don't start at the end of our career. We start at the beginning of our career. And that doesn't mean it has to be drudgery. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily clean toilets and shred people's paper. Um, nothing wrong with those jobs. It's just that most of us don't want to do those jobs, probably. Um, and we don't learn very much a lot of times from those jobs. But, but don't start off at the pinnacle. And I would say don't start off at the bottom either. Don't set your sights so low um, that you're missing other opportunities. Uh, sort of what we say in, in our business is that it's, it's, it's as easy to get a good job as it is to get a bad job. Um, it's just that we have to be, you know, we have to act a little differently. We have to use different techniques. And one of those techniques is that for us, and, and we've just found that this works best, um, but I'm not suggesting that you have to do this. I'm just saying that you should try this. Um, is that we found that, that artisanal businesses, businesses where people make things or deliver a service, that is, it's run by artisans, um, people who have sort of unique talents, um, are better businesses to hook up with than a lot of the retail businesses that we end up going to. And by retail, I mean, boy, everything from large corporate retail like McDonald's or Walgreens or whatever. And those are perfectly good companies. Don't, we've worked in both of those companies. Um, but, but I, you know, again, I'd rather go, you know, to the, the locally owned company that's, you know, that's making, you know, uh, custom sleeping bags or something. Um, you know, because, because first of all, it's probably not going to be a multinational corporation. It's not going to have a lot of, you know, like the, the bulk of jobs are not going to be in retail, although they may well have a retail side of the equation, and there's nothing wrong with that. But again, what we want is we want people to learn skills in their jobs, and we want to be around other people who know more than they do and are in a situation that help teach people how to grow into their jobs. And the idea is, let's say that you're working in a sleeping bag 
you know, manufacturing company in Park City. That would be a great place for, for that business. Um, you know, there's going to be seamstresses and there's going to be, you know, fabric cutters and there's going to be shippers and receivers and there's going to be a bunch of maybe somebody doing, you know, embroidery and, and whatnot. There are a whole bunch of artisanal tasks that go into that. So you can see those. They're, they're kind of obvious. Um, and, you know, you can maybe get a match there of, you know, uh, of, you know, somebody who wants to learn to sew but it's very early on in that. Um, you know, is there an opportunity maybe to introduce some technology like a computerized bar tacker into that process where, you know, you teach the person how to feed the fabric in but the equipment is computerized and it does the work, which is how, you know, most custom sewing happens these days or, you know, embroidery or things like that. Or maybe the person's into art and, and they need some, you know, they need artwork done or design work. Um, you know, again, this is a place where you could start the rudiments of that kind of job. The difference is that is that you know you're going to be in a place where you're going to learn from people who are actually making the stuff rather than just selling the stuff, and so there are the the jobs tend to be a little bit richer. Um, again, the the people who are making the product are the people who who also own the business uh, generally. And so hiring is a very personal thing for them. It's not an HR director somewhere. So you really have the ability to connect. So if you're taking somebody there because, you know, they have an outdoors theme, you know, and they're into outdoor sports and camping and mountain bike riding and whatnot, we already know that there's a cultural fit for that person there. Much easier to find that than in, you know, in a large retailer somewhere where, where there's a diverse culture, which is great, but there's nobody who you obviously hook up with and there's nobody there who says, oh, you know, I like mountain biking, you like mountain biking, let's get together and, and do some of that. And oh, by the way, let me show you how it is that we load the thread into our four color embroidery machine. So, uh, again, the, the idea of going to a business that's rich in skills, um, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody's got to be the top level. People all start at some level in there. Is there a place for somebody that you're working with to start in that artisanal business? Um, another way to look at this is, uh, again, to, you know, to, to the, well, I'll just give you these examples. So Melanie is a, a, a young lady that we work with, um, and she, um, she was a special ed student. We had met her just as she was coming out of high school. Uh, she had an intellectual disability and a psychiatric label, and she had sort of a reputation for being non-compliant and uh, could be, um, could be a, a handful sometimes, let's, let's put it that way. And um, so what they, what they did was they spent about $1,200 at a Vokeval lab and they ran her through um, uh, a, a battery of, of psychometric tests. And the psychometric test basically said a couple things. They said um, she needs a lot more training before she's work ready, but one of the places where we think that she could get um, where, where, where we think she could get that training is rolling silverware at Applebee's. And as we were working with her, what we saw was that she was an incredible artist. Um, you know, and we have pictures of her art. Uh, we were able to sell a couple of her still lifes, uh, uh, drawings of, of pears, actually, that she'd done. And she did what she called big art. Uh, you know, the, all these paintings were about three feet by four feet. And we went down to uh, the local health food store in the middle of town in, in the old town section of where she lived and sold two paintings for $700 uh, and took that back and said, you know, she'd have to sell a lot of art, but her art is really pretty. It's not bad art. I personally come from a family of artists, uh, even though I don't have any artistic skills. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I can tell the difference between good art and bad art, I guess. And, and I know that that's very subjective, but, um, so, so, you know, so we st sort of stood in contradiction to what the evaluation said and said, you know, we're going to go in this other direction. And we happen to have the adult DD provider in the, in the area that was taking her on, 
uh, working with us. And so a combination of funding sources, the school and, and the adult DD program and, and a little bit of VR uh, functional uh, assessment dollars that, that we could squeeze squeeze out. They'd already spent their money on the Vokey Val Lab. Um, what we did was was drill down a little bit through the discovery process, and we went out and did and and you know we asked this question: where where does where does the vocational theme make sense, or where does the career make sense? And we looked around at, at where other artists shed other themes too, but you know because we always look for three overarching vocational themes, but the the, the dominant one over and over again was was her art. And we'd also found that she'd done some uh, pottery work, and which wasn't very good, I'll say. It wasn't very good. And, and she, uh, she had done a, a little bit of some, some other, uh, some, uh, uh, some other like textile art and stuff. Uh, but her heart really was, was in, in the art world. And so we asked the simple question, you know, where do artists in this community work? And so we, you know, we sent the staff out to find every art-related business, and some of those were retail, and some of those were artisanal businesses, and a lot of them were individuals in their basement or in their garage throwing pottery or, you know, doing portraiture or, or whatever. And one of the places that we found was this bronze foundry, and it turns out there's a famous local Western artist who lives there, and and he's got his his, you know, his high-end bronze, you know, he does Western art, and this is a, a statue of one of his, one of his works, uh, you know, uh, in the Rocky Mountains, and, um, and he sold the presidents from, you know, from, you know, uh, I, I don't know, from LBJ on through, you know, Nixon and Reagan and, and Bush and Clinton and everybody else. Um, you know, so you can find his 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 statuettes in a lot of places. But he's also got this tourist trade, and it's across the the United States, and it's really big in in Japan and China and some other places. And so he exports these these little very thin bronze uh, 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 statuettes of horses and cowboys and stuff like that. And they're, they're cheap. I mean, they're, they're, they're not very high quality, but they are original designs. And so he's got a foundry there that, that he does these in. And you'd, you know, you'd never find it. You'd never see it. There's not a sign on it. Um, it's, you know, it's basically off of, uh, a, a, a not busy street in the suburbs. And, 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 uh, you know, you have to know how to get there to get there. And, and so, you know, we made, uh, we made an appointment to go out and do an informational interview, basically to, to introduce Melanie and to say, listen, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for a job, uh, in art. We're prospecting right now. We're not exactly sure what that's going to be. Uh, we're looking in obvious places. We don't know whether you have a job for Melanie or not, but, uh, we'd like for you to see her, her artwork. Uh, if you can hire her, that's great. If not, um, we just like for you to look at her portfolio and give us some ideas, and and we kind of soft sell it, sold it that way, and we and we went in, and it turns out, you know, we got a little conversation with the guy going about 20 minutes or so in the office, and it turns out that he was an artist and he'd been hired because of his ability to manage also, and so they had a crew of about a dozen people working there. And they had a couple different workrooms. The foundry obviously was out back, and they were pumping out these statuettes. And then they had a, a group of folks who were deburring them with, you know, basically Dremel grinders. Uh, and then, and then you had a, another room uh, where you had three or four artists sitting, and they were doing the finish work, like on a horse. They would take like a camel's hair, like a like a, a pinstriping brush. And they would take some some black or gray paint, and they would outline sort of the figure of the muscles, uh, so that it looked like the horse had movement or the cowboy had wrinkles or whatever, and uh, whatever the 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 foundry couldn't couldn't press into the metal. Um, and so they would do that, and then the stuff would be shipped off into the lacquer room, and it would get spray painted basically with a a coat of clear sealing uh, sealant and. 
and and then it would be packaged and shipped. And, and so there's a number of different departments going on, but about a dozen, maybe 15 people working there. And the guy made it really clear he wasn't hiring anybody. Uh, that wasn't going to happen. Um, and, and that was fine. He got that right out on the table. And we said, that's great. We'd like for you to look at, at, her, uh, at her portfolio, which we had put together. And so we had pictures of her art. And he looked through that. And we went out and we said, well, can we, you know, can we take a little tour? And we went out. And um, we went, you know, to the, the grinding room. And we saw that. And then we, we went in and we saw the, the artist worked with the pinstripe, the pinstriping. And, you know, I, I, I kind of nudged them and said, could we, uh, could we try that? Could, could Melanie try that? And I uh, said, sure. And so sat down and, uh, and he sort of showed her how, and, you know, did a really nice job of showing her how, how the paint went on. She'd never done this before. I don't think she'd ever held a pinstriping brush. And she nailed it. I mean, she just did it perfectly. And, and you could see, I mean, he was like, you know, he was just sort of befuddled by her ability to do that. And so we, we sort of finished the tour. And he didn't say anything, and, and we got, got, got done and ready to leave. And he said, do, do you think you can come back and start work on Monday? And, uh, and, you know, it was, it was great. And as far as I know, she's still working there. Um, and that, this has been, geez, probably eight years ago or so now. Um, and she continues to do her fine artwork uh, and, and work at the foundry. Again, as far as I, I haven't heard that she hasn't. Um, and and I, I stay in touch with the executive director, but I just haven't asked about her. We work with a lot of people there. Um, the other person, Rona, is kind of a unique way. Uh, that we went in. Um, uh, Roan is a young lady who has an intellectual disability and a physical disability, and she uses a, uh, a manual wheelchair. And she lives in the Deep South. And um, she, uh, she, had, she had a hobby of, and we learned this in, in going to, she'd been in day program for five or six years, I guess, when we met her. Uh, come out of transition and nothing was happening, so she was she was actually kind of lucky to be able to get into the day program. But she was terribly bored there and and not happy there. And um, uh, we picked her up uh, in a customized project that we were doing down there and um, went out and uh, and her her family during the the home visit uh, said, well, you know, like Rona's so great at 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 uh, you know doing uh, nails and and uh, you know uh, uh, painting nails and doing the cuticles and 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 all of that stuff the whole manicure thing um, but somebody at some point had tried to enroll her in a votech school where she could earn her certificate and basically she you know she couldn't pass the written test and the accommodations that she got were pretty poor and so she wasn't able she wasn't able to get into the class or pass the class is sort of the bottom line um and there's a lot of sort of that discrimination that still goes on unfortunately in the votech world and and all of us need to work on that but um but uh, uh we started looking for a job uh, for her, uh, and one of the places that that we ended up was doing an informational interview with the owner of a a, a beauty salon, and um, she shook her hand. Um, and Rona again has used a manual wheelchair since she was a little girl, and like <laughs> the the owner of the company, without any prompting, said, "Wow, you should be a manicurist. You have really strong hands." Well, guess what? This is why we're here. And to make a long story short, this took about six weeks to put together, by the way. Um, she, um, uh, the, the owner agreed to sponsor a, uh, a mentorship, an internship uh, through the state, uh, through the Department of Labor. Uh, and voc, voc Rehab played a role in this as well, as well as the Developmental Disability Agency, and put together a package that, that she would work uh, a couple hours a day, and she would work on her, basically on her curriculum as a work study. And so got through that, and, and um, while she was going through that, she wasn't making very much money. And we had some money in, in, in a budget, but you could do this through a, a, a pass plan, which we've talked about. Uh, you could do this through voc rehab. You could give, 
theoretically, you can do it through the Department of Labor, although it's a lot harder. Um, but we did have a Department of Labor grant, and we had cash in that grant to do things. So one of the things that, that we found out about the, the beauty salon was that it didn't have much in the way, way of upscale uh, beauty products, uh, in particular nail polishes. And, you know, the, the owner, in talking to the owner, the owner would, would like those. But, you know, to buy a rack like this rack that's pictured here, you have to invest at least like two or $3,000. They won't just sell you one rack of stuff. You have to buy into the company. Uh, and that's the way it is in a lot of, a lot of companies. Like, if you, like, you can't, like, buy a Ford pickup and declare yourself a Ford dealer and turn around and sell it and then buy another truck at wholesale. You, you have to like say, We're, I'm going to buy you know, half a million dollars worth of cars from you and I want a dealership and I promise to do all these. Even on, a, even on small products, uh, uh, we do that. Um, uh, uh, so so what we did was, was we sort of priced these things and we talked with the owner and said, you know, if we put one of these racks up in your business, could you help Rona with the inventory? And she'll pay you 20% of the proceeds. She'll keep 80% of the proceeds. But we think that it's going to bring you customers. And, and she agreed. And she said, yeah, I, I don't have a couple thousand dollars in cash just laying around to buy nail polish that may or may not sell. Um, you know, this is a small business. And so, um, so you know, we, we worked that out. We bought one rack over here for, I, I, maybe it was like $3,000. And then we bought one to put in a beauty salon across town on a bus route that was non-competing with that with that beauty parlor. And we worked all this out with the original owner. We said, w w we need a couple of these to make some money. And um, it, it turned out that, that, you know, it added a couple hundred dollars a month to her, to her paycheck. Uh, and again, she didn't have to pay back the money. We have loan money today that we can do stuff like that. So if, if you're working with somebody with an intellectual disability and you would want to do something like that, um, you know, uh, give me, drop me an email and we can talk as long as it's, as long as you've done discovery and as long as I've got paperwork that proves that you're going in the right direction, uh, you know, we're, we're interested in funding those kinds of things. So, um, you know, and, and we can discuss that, that program later. But again, creating wealth where there wasn't a lot, she went on and, and became a manicurist, uh, again, the demand for that was only part time, and there's transportation issues and all that kind of stuff. So again, working part time, but also having this other income and her learning about inventory and about ordering, those are things that she does a lot of those executive functions now. I'm not sure that she does all of them anymore. Um, and all the sales and all that are done by the beauty parlor. And then at the end of the month, they, you know, they recalculate how many bottles they sold. And this is the 80-20 split. And you get 80% of every dollar sold. Um, and that's how they do that. And it's just added into the paycheck as a bonus. Um, so. Um, uh, I, I noticed Lori's question because I think, I, and I, I don't usually stop in the middle and take questions, but I love the I love this question. I can appreciate the success with the foundry, uh, but you mentioned it was you know an out of the way business and not really visible. This is and, and how do we locate these? This is this is both the challenge and I think the power of a customized approach is that you know, it gets you off the main strip where all the businesses are, where, you know, where every small town or every large town has that, has that road where Home Depot and Lowe's and McDonald's and, you know, the big sporting goods dealer is and, and all that. Quit going to those places, you know? That's where all the job developers go. Once you start doing discovery, once you start doing lists of 20, once you start looking at vocational themes, what you start to do, and, and I'll give you an example of how you get started later in this, in this webinar, but um, these businesses are all around you, um, and, and the data that, that, I, that I just brought up sort of tells this story, that, 
in the United States, and, and these numbers are not correct. I, I could pick from eight different sets of numbers, but they're sort of they're sort of correct. Um, everybody kind of counts bus businesses differently in the in the federal government and in the, and in private industry. So, um, but a core, what I did was I took the U.S. Census and I took the Kauffman Foundation, uh, I took CFED, and and I sort of blended all their numbers and averaged, uh, and so I came up with about 34, 35 million businesses. Uh, in the United States. Uh, about 22 million of those are single owner-operated businesses. And that, that means that that company doesn't have employees. It doesn't mean they don't hire people. It just means they don't have employees. Like So for everybody who works for me is not an employee of Griffin Hammis Associates. Like uh, we have a staff person. Well, we have a couple staff people who work at universities, and we buy out their salaries half the year. They don't work for us. We They contract with us, but they represent us out in the field. They're the best at what they do, we think, in, in that area of the country. And and so uh, most, mostly we have employees. But um, but so this these single owner companies, let's say you got somebody down your road making uh, kitchen cabinets, um, you know, and most of the time he can he can make his cabinets and, and he only takes on enough work that he can handle, but every once in a while he gets a big job or a rush job, and so you know he goes out and finds a buddy who does carpentry work and hires him, not necessarily as an employee, but as a contract laborer for a while. So these businesses actually represent good places to do job development. A lot of times there are unmet unmet needs that that employer has, uh, things that would help them satisfy more customers or satisfy existing customers better. Um, there are, you know, special special things that, that you could add, bits of technology, um, you know, to single owner operated kinds of businesses. So, um, you know, we want to be looking at that. Um, uh, you know, and I can think of, you know, like a, a repair shop that we worked with uh, a while back. Um, that needed somebody to do oil changes because they realized that the owner realized that boy when I do oil changes you know it, it takes me away from the mechanic work that I like but oil changes are fast cash so you know so we were able to engineer a job doing that you know so you know again those single owner operators thank you <laughs> I had a surprise guest walk in <laughs> um, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, so, so don't you know? Don't don't worry about that. They might not be hiring. The other thing is that they have a supply chain. They're buying stuff from people all around them. A lot of times, they're locally sourcing uh, inputs, is what like farmers would call it. But uh, you know, the 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 mechanic is buying tools maybe locally uh, from the snap-on guy. You know, the guy who drives around in that in that van selling tools to all the, the all the mechanics in the valley. Um, you know, uh, uh, he's uh, buying uh, you know varnish down at the hardware store. Uh, you know, uh, going to to Finley's lumber mill and uh, getting specially cut oak or something. So there's all these other businesses that are in the chain. And and Lori, that's kind of you know once you get into one business, you can ask. You know, well, who do you sell to? What's your customer chain? Where are you buying your stuff? Oh, that's your supply chain. And then you can start to mine those. So it starts to open up the community. And again, I know that I've talked about this before, um, so I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but um, you know that that I, my wife and I live in a in a small town, and my wife's going to be doing the webinar on rural job development next week, I think, and. Um, uh, you know, we, we live in this small town, it's about 900 people, and we live outside of town, and we live on a dead-end road that's about two miles long. And, and there's, you know, 24 families on the road, but there's a dozen small businesses on the road, and there's no signs. You actually have to know that community to know where the businesses are. And, it, and I hate to admit it, but I think we've lived there for about 17 years now, and I can tell you that I'm always finding new people who are doing things out of their garage or 
or whatever. I think the last time maybe we had a webinar, I was talking about the hot tub factory that's about a mile from our house that I never knew was there. Uh, and it's an actual, like, a little factory. It's in, it's in a building. It's down a hollow, so you wouldn't necessarily see it from the road. Um, but I had no idea they were there. And, you know, they're not selling particularly locally, although they are. They're manufacturing for large retailers. So um, again, it's it's uh, this is part of why discovery pops up over and over again in this process. Um, there are also 11 million businesses with one to 19 employees. And again, so if you take these 33 million businesses, that's a lot of businesses to go find. And they're everywhere. They're in even the smallest, remotest town. We can find these businesses. And, and, you know, rehabilitation staff are not as active in their communities sometimes as, as we would like them to be. They don't know their communities very well. And, and part of that is, you know, is because people are young. They're starting out in their careers. They don't have a lot of money. They can't join Rotary, maybe. All those, you know, those, those more formal networking operations. But it's, it's, you know, it's not hard to go to the local bar or the local cafe and strike up conversations, you know, uh, becoming a regular or whatever, or, you know, going to church and finding that out. And I've, I've kind of been intrigued in, in Utah that people don't use their, their connections more um, because Utah is such a, a community-centered state. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure I, I, I understand the reluctance to ask family and friends for, for connections. Um, maybe, maybe that's a discussion for another day. You'll notice that for 500 and more employees, that, that those are the corporate stores that you're going to do job development in, that every job developer on earth is going to, by the way. Um, so you have lots of competition. Um, these, are, these are the Lowe's and the Home Depots and the Walgreens and the Walmarts and the McDonald's. And, and, and the, again, those are perfectly good companies. We've worked with all those companies. They're good companies. Um, but boy, it takes a lot of effort to get through the, RA, the HR system. And a person who is as qualified as another applicant but has a disability stands almost no chance of getting a job in those companies. I mean, statistics bear us out. Um, you know, uh, that, that if, if you can get through the process of the, the sort of the automated fill out the resume online, you know, and, uh, or the application online, send us, you know, upload your scanned resume, uh, all those things conspire against the person uh, who has a disability. So, Again, we look in this in this middle area, these 33 million businesses, just because the odds are better. Uh, they don't employ as many people as those big corporations do. We know that. But we don't have billions and billions of people that we have to get jobs for either. So uh, again, we, I think you're better off looking for the small employers. It's le it less hoops to jump through. And again, we're all sensitive about time. The time it takes to get through a formal hiring process is offset, you know, by discovery and by good job development. I'm not going to tell you this is cheaper. I'm going to tell you it's better, uh, that we see better job retention, we see better wages, and we see more hours when we do it this way. Uh, and and there's, there's publications coming out uh, on this uh, and more studies to come. We're involved in a couple studies uh, on this right now, but we have data from, from labor on projects that we've done in the past that bear us out on this. So um, some of the rules, uh, we avoid big sign syndrome, that is that we drive down the road looking for the sign that is going to solve all our problems. The, the Hardee's or the, you know, A&W or the, the, you know, the, all the fast food and all the big, uh, you know, furniture companies and, and remodeling companies and Target and Walmart and all those. I, I just drive on by those because um, everybody, they, they know, and, and I know that you've all been in a place you walk in and go, Oh, well, you know, we represent so-and-so, and I have an individual that, that would really like to work here. And they go, oh, you know what? We already work with Goodwill, or we already work with uh, Upwards Down School, or we work with this group already. And we, you know, their job developers are the one that we work with. Um, you, know, you know you've heard that if you've done job development for more than a year. 
Um, don't go to those places. Don't you know? You don't need to compete. There's so many other places to go. Um, again, I'm not against retail. There's a lot of intricacy and a lot of retail. The problem is that we don't tend to get those intricate jobs. We don't get those jobs that lead to more. You know, we tend to get jobs that are high turnover, and because people with disabilities tend to stay longer in those jobs, they tend not to be advanced in their careers. Uh, or taught higher level skills. Now, if you're a good job coach, you're able to make that happen in the negotiation. And this is where negotiation is important. You can go to Tark and say, I understand that for the first six weeks of this job, I have to open boxes in the warehouse. And I'm not really interested in opening warehouse boxes. I'm interested in fashion. And that's why I wanted to be out in the, you know, in the men's department, you know, like helping customers and, and doing this and stocking shelves and all that. Um, you know, during the negotiation, if you can make that happen, that's great. It's not typical. It's not typically what happens in those large retailers. Um, and a lot of the jobs have been made routine, uh, and they're not high-skill jobs by any means. Uh, you also have to sort of pass the test of, of being face-to-face -face with customers. And, you know, a lot of times people with disabilities don't, mat don't, don't pass that test for whatever reason. Uh, again, this idea of getting to know your communities, and there's a thousand ways to do that. Um, I, I really have, you know, in the past in organizations and whatnot, you know, we've installed uh, the, the ability for staff to have sort of their tuition paid to join Kiwanis or Rotary, uh, you know, to be able to take a VR counselor to lunch once in a while is a really nice thing to do, uh, to be able to take a business person to lunch. We, we do a lot of business over lunch in this country, right, or to go or golf. Um, you know, the other piece is to have uh, you know, frontline staff who are trained to, to talk to business people. And we, we just did a, a visit this morning uh, to a manufacturing company, and I was talking to uh, one of the upper-level managers this morning, and we were talking about the fact that they get approached uh, occasionally. They're kind of off the circuit, but th they have been approached in the past uh, to hire folks with disabilities, and it's presented as a charitable act. And, you know, we don't want to do that. We want to do that as an economic development uh, uh, process, that here's a person who's going to make you a profit just like anybody else. They're going to contribute to their bottom line. They, you're, they're going to fit into your culture, uh, you know, that, that, that it makes sense for them to be working here. Um, so uh, I, I think also recognize that there's a ton of commerce that goes on, even in the smallest communities. And that my guess is that, you know, if you're here on the front range, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in Utah, um, there is no way in, in any of the communities around here that you're going to go to every business that's here. Uh, there's just too many of them. Uh, there's so many businesses here, and there's a lot of home-based businesses uh, in this state, too. And home-based businesses are tough to find, but they're out there. They're doing business, right? And they're paying taxes. Um, so, you know, get to know your neighborhoods, get to know your communities, get to know the families of people with disabilities, because they're all connected to people who are working as well. And so, you know, once you get that ball rolling, it kind of snowballs, and you, you what, what tends to happen is we, we are overwhelmed by opportunity, that we actually end up with more places than what we ever dreamed that we could find. But you got to get out. You got to go and do it. It, 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 it. it doesn't walk into your office and find you. Um, uh, again, you know, we create opportunities through economic development. We think differently about work. And, and so if you go back to Rona and buying those, those things, or in Minnesota, I think I talked about Scott on one of these, where, you know, we help Scott finance a, a $16,000 ice cream making, making machine. And so he was working at a restaurant, but he's really into ice cream and making ice cream. And so now he's in charge of ice cream production. There is a young man with a developmental disability, and the company loves him. They've branded his ice cream as Scott's ice cream. It's now being sold in retailers outside of the restaurant, and you know, and they split the profits on that. So you know, that's another way. And that was, you know, that was a slam dunk. We had the financing for that in about 48 hours through our loan program, and we were able to do that. 
Um, you know, it, you don't have to be a banker or a Wall Street analyst to do this stuff. We, we know how to do this, and, and other people out there know how to do it too. And employers kind of perk up, you know, as long as, as long as you can do it, as long as you have the skills to do it. If you don't have the skills to do it, it can blow up in your face. Um, so again, you know, I, I think one of the hardest things that, that we try to capture in all this is this idea that we don't live in a world of scarcity. That there, you know, we don't have to take this job just because it was offered, right? We had a job offer yesterday and, uh, and, and it was the wrong job for the wrong person. And so, you know, that, that, well, that, 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 thank you very much, but that's not going to fit this person and we don't have anybody in mind right now who, who that job would fit, but boy, that's kind of nice when you get a job offer. It's just that we know there's unlimited jobs. We just have to go find them, right? I know it doesn't always seem like that. So when we talk about this supply chain thing, um, this is something that some of us have done naturally over the years, and it's something that you can start to introduce into your own repertoire of, 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 of you know how you do your job and again this is one approach it's not the approach it's an approach in your toolbox so let's take this scenario and this works from bottom up okay so so we start with an individual and you know and and and, and let's say you get somebody a job and they're bagging groceries Okay, and, and this is something that we've done traditionally for folks with intellectual disabilities is get them a job. What I would say, you know, starting out is I would ask the question, why? And usually the answer is, well, we went to this place because we knew they were hiring and this was a good place to get job experience. And, you know, those things are true and that's all good. The problem is that a lot of times people don't fit those jobs very well, and they kind of look incompetent in them, and then they take a lot of job coaching, or they take a lot of supervision from the employer, and employers and customers get a negative view of them. Now, on the other side of that, there are some people who do great at those jobs, and they're a real positive reinforcer, very public reinforcer, so don't hear me say it's one or the other, it's both, right? But what I would say, it's no harder to say, gee, we did discovery with this person. We're not just going to go out and look at who's hiring. We always know there's a bagger job available because they turn over every six weeks, right? They're not particularly good jobs for people who want natural supports because your natural support, your peer group leaves on average every five or six weeks, right? So you want, a, you want stable coworkers. The other piece is that there's almost no history of advancement from bagging. Um, you know, uh, even, even David Letterman, who started out as a bagger, uh, had, to, had to go into show business, right? A totally different thing. He didn't end up like the owner of a, a grocery store in Indianapolis, right? Um, but let's say you got somebody there, and they really are there because they've got an agricultural or a food or a culinary arts theme, and it seemed like a great place to start, and you could get some money in their pocket. Those are all great reasons. But now let's look up, you know, when we're putting something in a bag, all the work's been done to that product, pretty much. Now, you're going to take it home and cut it up and make it into something else, right? But, you know, if you're, if you're packaging beef or whatever it is and you're throwing in a bag for a customer, all the work, all the skilled work's taken out of that, right? So if the person, you know, has... The, through, from discovery, if you've been hearing and, and seeing evidence that says, boy, you know, this person really does have an agricultural theme or a, uh, you know, a culinary arts or a food theme, whatever you want to call it, let's look, let's, let's go find where that hamburger came from, you know, and, and, and so we might go, you know, to the next level, and these are, these are the questions that you ask in an informational interview, or you just talk to somebody, you just say, hey, where do you buy your beef? Oh, well, we source it from the Heber Valley, right? And, and, you know, well, you know, who, who drives the truck that brings it there? Oh, that's from Andy's Wholesale Meats. Oh, so Andy's is right down the street. Great. Let's go see Andy. Um, you know, at the wholesaler level, we might find that there's a ton of jobs there, right? And again, maybe low skill, maybe mid skill, whatever, you're learning something, right? Packing boxes, you're doing value added processing maybe. I used to work for a, whole, uh, a food wholesaler when I was in high school and you know we would process, we would make pickles 
and we would uh, process other products and and do repackaging. You know, if you have a you know a, a a crate of squash come in, you know, you might take them and and wrap them in cellophane two at a time and and price them for the local store or something like that. So you're doing value added kinds of things. You might learn logistics: what truck goes where with what load on it. You know, on Wednesday, uh, you, there's the whole transportation theme. Uh, uh, work at, at work and uh, at work there, uh, customer service stuff. And again, you might want to. Well, that's not really where I wanted to be. Let's let's look let's look up farther. I'm I'm really into you know into into uh, our artisanal cheeses or whatever, uh, or I'm really into dairy or or whatever it is. You know, again, you're going to go there, and a variety of, a, a variety of of processes and products are going to take you in different directions. Um, you know, with the beef, you're going to go maybe to the local farmer or the local rancher. Uh, that might take you to the local butcher shop. It might take you then to the person at who runs the grain elevator. Uh, it might take you, uh, you know, to a large animal vet. Uh, again, you're going up this this process. So, you know, we we end up at cheese making maybe, and and there's a place that's can you know you're going to learn about cleanliness, chemistry, measuring, cooking. Uh, portioning, packaging, business to business sales and service maybe. You're probably not going to be interested in all of those things, but that's just a wide a wide range of the things that go on there. Uh, again, we kind of get stuck in our default and we go, oh, let's go clean. Oh, we can clean that. You know, why are we always cleaning things for people? I, I mean, I like things clean, but I don't want to clean your stuff. I, I, yeah, I'm not wild about cleaning my stuff. Um, don't assume that because people do that at the workshop or, or you know, or in the school that that's what they want to do. It's what they're allowed to do. It's what they've been exposed to. Um, so think beyond that. And again, there's nothing wrong with those jobs. It's just there's so much more to the world that that there's so much there's so much that needs to be done that's not cleaning. Um, you know, and again, if if we go up, we end up at the goat farm, sort of at at you know that 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 uh, you know the 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 uh, the point of uh, the the point of the source, really. Uh, so you you know you're talking to goat farmers, and and boy, what would you learn there? Milking and 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 animal care, and again, cleanliness because there's health and safety stuff, and feeding and maintenance, and 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 breeding and farm tests, and you know the related careers of growing grain and farming and weaving and butchering and cooking and veterinary and ranching and maintenance and all kinds of stuff that's related to this one thing, this one person who's bagging groceries. Now, if you see, if you break, you know, if you break the product down or the service down, and you look at the inputs that came in to make that a possibility, right? Now you start to see sort of the richness of a supply chain, and all products and services have a supply chain, right? And we have a we have a customer supply chain, and we have a you know an input provider supply chain. So it's it's how creative can you be at mining these data, at 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 going upstream to where the product came from? And so you know to get back to Lori's great question, this is one of the ways that we do this: is that we break it down and we go, okay, well if the person's like really interested in in you know in in whatever in in animals, let's say. Well, you know, animals does not mean going to the Humane Society. They're not hiring you anyway, right? They don't hire people. They rely on volunteers. There's like a couple jobs there. How many people make a living with animals? Well, go up the supply chain. You know, first of all, make a list of everybody who works with animals that you that you know um, and that you don't know. I mean, just businesses in the community. And, there's, you know, there's hundreds of them. Right, but we don't think about the taxidermist as working with animals, and we don't think about you know the 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 chemist, uh, you know who's who's making uh, food nutrition additives for horses. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're not thinking uh, uh, you know uh, about the compounding pharmacy that maybe the veteran the the, the veterinarian relies on for um, you know vaccines for cows. We're not thinking about those things, but you know, I've, I've visited all those people in my work. Um, you know, when you're thinking about somebody who's interested in, again, who has a culinary arts thing, but, 
but is not going to do very well maybe in a restaurant setting, in a high pressure setting like that. Um, you know, this is how we found, you know, a chili company uh, where the family was packaging uh, chilies from uh, or spices from Mexico uh, in their garage and, and, you know, selling, you know, half a million dollars a year in packaged spices to local grocery stores. Um, there was a job there and there was no sign, there was no there was no uh, website, there was no email address, there was no phone number, right? It's all done inside the family and through connections. And so, you know, you you work backwards from there, you go to the supermarket that sells that company's spices and you say, where do you get those? Well, we go out to this garage out on River Road. So if we look at this a little bit differently, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm running long here and I apologize, it's, it's, it's a fun topic. Um, so let's say that you do have like a cleanliness theme, and a lot of times themes sort of co-appear and it's hard to break them apart. Um, uh, you know, like, like uh, I, I knew this guy growing up who uh, loved old cars, but he didn't know anything about them. He couldn't fix them, uh, but, but he could clean them. And he loved to do that. Now, he didn't do any of this for a living. This was kind of his hobby, um, you know, but I was thinking about Eddie uh, when I was working with a guy uh, who was very much into cars and whatnot and, and really presented as, oh, I, you know, I want to work for a dealership and I want to do, you know, this stuff, but I don't want to get greasy. I do not like getting dirty. Do not make me touch anything that's got dirt on it. Well, that's really hard. You know, that's really hard, uh, you know, in a, in a garage uh, to not get greasy. Um, and, and so what we find is we find these other complementary things. And even doing, of course, doing cleanliness things, uh, you know, we end up getting dirty too. So, uh, so we ended up going, you know, in a, a slightly different direction. But, um, but a person who, who presents maybe with a cleanliness theme, cleanliness different than cleaning, right? It, it elevates it elevates cleaning, again, away from maybe scrubbing somebody's toilet to, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe doing uh, patient trays at a clinic, right, uh, or, or, or doing, you know, dental hygienist work or, or you know, uh, again, uh, 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 working, working, you know, in a dairy where you're, you're, you're part of your job is to make sure that the milk parlor is clean for when the health department comes by every week. Uh, all of those things have a cleanliness theme, but they're also surrounded by other skills and tasks that you're going to learn that may or may not be related to that theme. They might be related to this other theme, like a transportation theme. So somebody with, with both sort of a co-occurring cleanliness and transportation theme, well, one of the obvious places that you might look is as a finished man position at a local car wash. You know, you go through the car wash and those guys at the end, you know, or at the beginning, they scrub your car a little bit. They do a little bit of the hand work. Uh, maybe, you know, towel you off a little bit with a chamois or whatever. Um, those could be both, you know, a, a, a transport, a transportation theme or a cleanliness theme. Um, they tend to be very high turnover. There's also, because you have high turnover and your coworkers in that, in that position are usually your natural support in a work site, and again, the more natural support you have, the less it costs over time because it's less job coaching, right, and more natural relationships occurring. And also, there's a lot of judgment calls, and the person that I was thinking about at this point or working with at this point is not good at judgment calls. Is that clean or not clean? Did I get half the bug off or did I get the whole bug off, right? Um, that makes a difference. Some people would get half the bug off and say, well, that's good enough because it's a judgment call. Are you working with a person who makes good judgment calls and can you teach those, right? Um, well, another place to look maybe is at a uh, is as a fleet detailer at a local cab company, you know, or a trucking company or a utility company. Like, you know, we uh, developed a job for a guy at UPS once, which is a big company, right? But they have these local little offices there, you know, and you know they they take very good care of their trucks, and those trucks get washed really often. 
uh, and they get vacuumed out and they get cleaned. And it's the same crew every time because it's, for the most part, it's a union shop, right? And so those drivers and, and everybody, they hold on to those jobs because their contracts are very good. Uh, and so you don't have a lot of turnover there. And so you have a lot of natural support, which means that you can get out, you can let the natural relationships happen. But you could also look, well, geez, who else does detailing? Well, there's a detail crew at most car dealers. Now, a lot of them have outsourced that, but there's a place to look. We were looking at, at a job at, a, at a, an upscale, very upscale car dealership in a big city uh, once. And what we discovered was that um, part, of the, part of the deal was that, I mean, these are, these are $100,000 cars coming in and out all day to get mechanical repair and tune-ups and stuff like that. And so part of the deal is that all the mechanics wear white uh, jumpsuits. And, you know, mechanics get dirty. Even on a $100,000 car, mechanics get dirty. And so in, in, in working up this supply chain, we ended up at a car dealer with this guy who really did have a cleanliness theme. Uh, and we thought he'd ended up probably like detailing cars. Um, what we found in the, in the conversation with the employer was that they were spending a fortune on laundry services for these uniforms because, you know, they got eight or nine mechanics and they're greasy every day. And so, you know, every day they're spending, you know, a hundred or more dollars on just cleaning. Uh, and so what ended up happening, and this is, this is an odd one, um, but we set up a laundry inside the, the dealership and he runs the laundry and he does all of the cleaning, all the shop towels, all of the, you know, all of the, the jumpsuits, uh, and there's, there's other things uh, that get cleaned too. Uh, and the savings more than paid for the equipment and his, and his, uh, his uh, salary. So, you know, again, along the way, you find things that you didn't think, uh, you find opportunities that you didn't think you were going to find along the way. Um, and, you know, even adding this person and putting in a washer and dryer, uh, and he does other tasks too, he doesn't do that all day long, but um, putting that in actually saved the employer cash. Uh, so, you know, again, a, a, another opportunity for economic development. If we went a little further, we might look into auto body, cleaning up and, and sanding. There's a lot of cleaning that goes on in a, in a dealership. If somebody's got a cleanliness theme and a transportation theme, that's a great place to go. Um, and there's real entry level jobs there. And what they, there's, you know, uh, I, I've worked in a body shop too. And, you know, one of the things that you find is you come in and they teach you really rudimentary things like how to run a dual action sander. And so you learn how to do that. And then when you get good at that, you get to do some finish sanding. And then you learn how to mask a car off. Maybe they have you like pulling trim off, uh, or pulling bumpers off, maybe pulling dented fenders off. Um, you know, back when I was younger, um, we actually fixed cars. We didn't like just, you know, throw on a new fender or a quarter panel. You actually had to beat them out with a, you know, a hammer and dolly and, and they teach you that and then they teach you how to paint and, you know, maybe you put on primer for several years. I primed cars. I never got to the point there where they trusted me to put a finish coat on a car that was left for the painter and that was his job. But I learned 20 different things, 20 different skill sets, and my salary went up as I went there. And, you know, and again, I only worked, you know, I worked for a larger company, and so I, you know, I split my time between that department and two other departments. Um, but I learned a whole bunch, and I didn't go in there necessarily knowing how to do those things. Um, and again, you know, as we take this a little farther, maybe we're det a detailer trainee at a specialty car restoration company. Maybe you're working with somebody like we worked with in Ohio who only wanted to work on Mustangs, and it was really hard to get him. You know, it's hard to find a company that only restores Mustangs. But we found a company pretty close to that and were able to, to work with him and get him in entry level. We had to buy tools. We had to buy him a welder. Uh, and this was a guy who basically was considered unemployable. Uh, but the owner, the job coach couldn't figure out how to teach him how to use a MIG welder, so the owner trained him. And, and you know, uh, it's worked out great. He does, he does entry level kinds of kinds of tasks for anybody else in that business. But for him, he's learned 
a ton of things. He's learned how to run a sandblaster and how to run a MIG welder, you know, and how to put in sheet metal uh, patches and, you know, and, and just on and on and on the things that he's learned in doing that. And again, how did we get this? We went up the supply chain from, you know, something that was obvious on the street to saying, oh, well, where does this person get this done and what about this specialty company? Um, and so we, you know, again, we can ask some questions. Was cleaning cars just the entry point for, for something more mechanical, uh, where, where we can be around people with other similar themes? We like to be around people with similar themes because then we fit in better and they teach us better. Uh, and, and what else could we have explored? Well, we didn't, we didn't really explore trucking companies or mass transit or railroads or airports, um, you know, but we could have. Right, and and as far as like cleanliness stuff, we could have gone to healthcare, food products, clean room manufacturing. Um, all companies have some level of cleanliness. Um, you know, what about and thinking broader than that? You know, when we start to ask, where does this career make sense, or where do people with similar themes work? Well, we find out that there's another view of cleanliness, right? It's I, I had a brother-in-law who was an environmental engineer, right? I mean, you know, and worked for the EPA and 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 stuff like that. That's a different kind of cleanliness, and that gets into advocacy, maybe. And geez, reforestation and recycling and hazmat materials; those are all, to some degree, cleanliness-related, right? I know it takes you a little far afield, but the power in this, the power in thinking up the supply chain sort of lifts the burden of, of looking on Craigslist for job openings. So let's say, you know, let's take another entry level kind of thing and let's say that somebody has a construction theme. We've worked with a number of people who say, you know, I want to do manly things in a manly way with other men, you know, it's a uh, uh, you know, um, uh, not that women aren't invited, obviously, but um, but the construction theme seems to come up fairly often, uh, and so you can you can start out with like custom home builders and whatnot. Uh, they have you know cleanup folks that that come in and sort of follow the carpenters around. Sometimes they're there on site. Sometimes they have to come after the end of the day, which is not good for natural support or inclusion. Um, Again, these can tend to be high turnover kind of jobs, um, but there is a high potential for, for natural support because um, the crews tend to be fairly steady. Uh, the subcontractors, you know, once, a, once a, a builder has found a good subcontractor, they tend to stick with them. Um, and there's, there's career potential there. I mean, you know, if you're around picking up after, and we've seen this in jobs that we've created with custom home builders, um, if, you, if you start out, picking up scrap lumber, um, but you have a real interest in nail guns, which is a guy that I'm thinking about in particular, um, you, you know, this guy would sort of finish his cleaning up real quick so that he could stand by, you know, a carpenter running a, a nail gun. Well, what naturally happens when the job coach isn't watching is, hey, let me show you how to run this nail gun. And that is what happens. And, um, and, and really, the job coach ought to be making that happen if, if it's OK with everybody. Um, it can be kind of seasonal. It can be an erratic work schedule, as we all know. Um, but if we went up the chain, let's say we have that construction theme. OK, that's one entry point. What about lumber or, or, or hardware wholesaler? And again, I like to think about the little local companies, our local timber mill, uh, where I live in. We actually have two of them. Uh, two uh, finish mills uh, in our town, and they employ about four or five people each. That's it. Uh, but they're still lumber mills. And, uh, you know, uh, my, my guess is that there's never been a job developer go to, go to either of those places. Um, you know, what about an HVAC company? Uh, you know, or all the different, you know, think about a custom home builder and going and doing an uh, informational interview with them and just asking the question, well, who, who, what's, what's in your supply chain? Well, all these subcontractors, my sheetrock people, my electricians, my plumbers, uh, all of those people are, you know, uh, you know, if, if we're selling spec homes, uh, you know, is, is, do I have a decorator? Just think about, you know, again, the layers and layers of different inputs of different 
businesses that you potentially could go do job development with that would match somebody who has a construction theme, right? Then we get over into the, sole, the whole real estate side of things and, and the, the, the more functional parts of real estate like home inspection or property management. Uh, I had a videographer, a guy that was really into video stuff, do some of his first work for real estate companies. Right, because they were just starting, you know, to put video up of houses on their website. Right? And so, you know, again, how did we get there? We got there through a supply chain. Right? We didn't start out with, oh, I've got a, a guy who likes to make videos and we immediately thought of real estate. No, we ended up there through going up somebody's supply chain and suddenly real estate popped up. Right? And that's what happens, is that you, you can't predict where you're going to go with this, which is what I think makes it energizing and fun. Um, so we get into tool repair and, and tool rental. Um, you know, and again, you know, think about the inputs. Where does, where does the lumber come from? So now we're into forestry. Where did, the, where did the foundation come from? Well, now we can go to the cement plant or the cement contractor. You know, some guy who's building forms in his garage and, and going out. I, there's a guy down the road from me, Mike, who is a cement contractor, right? And he's got a couple guys that, that he works with, but, you know, but he's the cement contractor, and he goes out and works on big jobs and small jobs, you know, and he does design work and he does physical work at the same time. Um, you know, what about the lumber mill? What about the, all the raw materials producers, landscape design, gardening, greenhouse, tree farm, all of those things, especially is, is there also an accompanying agricultural theme? What are the self-employment options? We haven't talked about that. We're going to talk about that next time. What about renting tools? What about being a subcontracted painter, right? What about site cleanup, you know, your own company that does that? Again, is there a cleanliness theme? Is there a construction theme? Um, you know, uh, what are the resource ownership options to enhance career growth? Uh, maybe you maybe you also have like a food theme or a culinary arts theme. So maybe maybe you specialize in mobile catering to construction sites. Who knows? There are people who do that kind of stuff um, or getting special. Specialized training, like an apprenticeship or an internship, owning equipment. We have a, a guy that we work with that we ended up. Uh, he worked for a custom home builder. Uh, he started as as basically at uh, you know cleaning up after the carpenters. They taught him how to do some entry level sort of car, uh, carpentry stuff. Uh, it turned out that he had this real fascination with tools, and one of the tools that he especially liked was the backhoes and and the the, the um, uh, bobcats that they would rent occasionally. Uh, he ended up, uh, to supplement his income, we helped him finance uh, a bobcat, uh, and the company, the owner of the company, rents out his bobcat for him because he doesn't do executive function stuff. He's not good at sales or bookkeeping or calling people back. Uh, and the construction company has a clerical office, so they can say, yes, uh, we have a bobcat available. If you ever want to rent it, it's this much. And so the company gets 20% for storing it and whatnot. Uh, he gets 80% of the sales, and they've taught him how to drive the bobcat. And so he does lot leveling now, and he moves gravel and pea gravel and stuff like that around. So, you know, again, they're sort of the, the road is kind of limitless here. Um, and again, just a reminder that, that, that I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but that themes are not job descriptions. Themes are the overarching, uh, 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 you know, the container of many, many job, job descriptions. Um, and they're, they're big. They hold hundreds of thousands of job descriptions many times. Uh, and again, you know, try to reframe uh, what we're going on, and I, I, again, I covered a lot of this stuff, so I'm going to try to wrap up and, and take some questions. Um, you know, I, I just did a really quick Google search, uh, American Fork, uh, Utah, which has a population of 27,000. Now, we know it's much bigger than that because it's surrounded by the whole metropolitan area here, but the actual, like, border of, of the, the inside the borders of American Fork, there's 27,000. So what I did was I thought, well, if I had somebody with an agricultural theme, an artisanal theme, I just plugged that in because I, I wasn't exactly sure what that was, and a fashion theme, um, uh, look at all these hits that I came up with. Um, now, you know, I, just because agriculture produces 10 million hits doesn't mean there's 
there's 10 million jobs in American Fork and agriculture. But it means there's two or three people who work in agriculture that I can call up or I can go to their store, I can find them, and I can start the conversation. And to get back to Lori's great question, this is how we start the process if we don't already know the businesses in our community. Um, fashion, 17 million hits. I can certainly find one or two people who are working in a fashion-related industry in American Fork, right? Um, and you can do, obviously, I did a broad hit. You can refine your, you can refine your searches, uh, you know, and get a little bit closer to, to, to where you're going. Um, and again, some of this I already talked about, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, skip ahead. But uh, again, when we're using these informational interviews as a job development process, not as a discovery process, we really are telling people that we're looking for a job. Um, and what I'm looking for when I'm there is I'm trying to look for a, a match between dress and humor and orientation. You know, what's the orientation process? Uh, are they formal or are they informal in their power? Uh, what's the role of technology in a company? We saw some high tech and some very low tech stuff today in the same company. Um, you know, how do they treat customers? Uh, you know, uh, I'm staying at a Hampton Inn and Hampton Inn's all about shine. Right, that's their slogan in, uh, with their staff, shine. That means whenever you see anything dirty in a Hampton Inn, you, it's your job to shine it. doesn't matter whether you, you're the owner or the manager or the housekeeper, you're supposed to keep everything clean. Um, again, you know, what are the social re relationships like? How formal is the place? Is there a lot of bureaucracy? Is there teamwork? Is there natural support? All those things that go into, again, a, a typical job development or a job analysis that we're looking for. Um, and again, I'm just going to skip through this stuff because I kind of talked about what I want to talk about and we we're kind of out of time anyway. Uh, uh, you know, it always goes by for me in about 15 minutes. But I wanted to go back and read some of the questions and also open it up, Tim, if you want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk about some of this stuff as well. Um, I wanted to read Christine's. It takes me a minute to digest these. Uh, Christine writes, I've found that people love to talk about what they do for a living. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're not the only people who like to do that. Um, uh, yes, and and John's right on with the with the the uh, John. I think John's in the other room from where I am right now. Um, are there other questions? I'm trying my uh, my thing isn't working too well here. Um, and Tim, did you wanna did you wanna weigh in? And uh, I'm I'm open to other questions. If you have questions, type them in now. Or I think Tim can open up your. Uh, your, uh, sure, your yeah. microphone you wanna, a little if bit. If you want to ask a question, all you have to do is hit the raise your hand button and I can open up your mic and you can actually talk talk into the microphone. So if you have a specific question, feel free to raise your hand and you can ask Carrie the question. And Carrie, I just, you know, I think it's so important and you, you hit on this several times is like there are a lot more jobs out there than those traditional F jobs that we always look for for people with disabilities. And it's really the jobs are limitless and it's, uh, it's um, you know, based on our creativity and how far we network with these employers. And I, I just think that's such an important point to stress to everybody that it's a big, big world out there and there are a lot of businesses that we can tap into rather than just your typical F jobs in your big box store. So excellent point. Yeah. And, and, and again, nothing wrong with those. It's just we could do so much more, I think. And it makes job development easier. Well. Um, this question, economic development, what if you don't have a business experience? Well, you know, that, that's, that's okay. You know, I, I've, I don't think, well, I guess I've taken some business courses in my, in my past. I have, to, I have to think back a long time. Not that they were relevant to anything. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I think just understanding how things work a little bit, that, that you know, if I run a company, my my banker, my my mortgage broker does not care how nice a guy I am. All they care about is did I pay my mortgage? And not to put you know such a blunt end on it, but you know we have to go in understanding that 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 most businesses are not in a position to hire people because it makes them feel good. That is one of the things that we know though. We know that people do feel feel good about that. 
Um, but I think it's a dollars and cents thing. I think what you want to do is just respect the business and respect the person that you're working for, you know, the, the person with a disability, understand what, what the skills and the tasks that they can do and that you can teach and the, the overarching theme or interest that brought you there in the first place. That there, there needs to be some form of data that takes you to the place that you're doing job development, not just that there's a job opening. And I don't think you, <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, uh, that's a great question. I don't, I don't think you know, you need to know how to wheel and deal, although there's certainly some of that. I always feel sort of the salesman in me coming out when I'm doing job development. Uh, because there is stuff like that, but you know, anybody can sell. I don't think everybody's, you know, born to be a salesperson. I know, I, you know, I couldn't do it. Uh, every day, I've got to have you know other other stuff um, going on. But um, but I, I you know again, I think it's I think it's you treat people with respect. Um, and and I don't especially like wheeler dealers. I don't think most of us do. I I think what we like are people who are honest with us and can say you know what you know here's here's I've I've uh, you know I'm I'm representing David here and. And you know, and and here's David's portfolio, and David's going to need some extra support in these areas, maybe. And I will have worked that out with David ahead of time if David can't represent himself very well. And some people can't, and some people can. It's one of the reasons why we use a you know a digital portfolio or a digital resume is that we have those pictures showing what people can do and. If, if the person can sort of narrate and, and go along and give their pitch, which a lot of people can, that's great. Otherwise, maybe we can, you know, narrate it with a soundtrack or, you know, we can do some of the talking together or however you present that. I don't think you want to wheel and deal. I, I, I think people, fit, you know, I, I think people are, are, are tired of that. Um, we're not really selling people. What we're doing is we're saying, here is a match, and it makes you know, again, you don't have to oversell this, but it does make economic sense. And you know, I was talking to the the the, the manager this morning at this company, and he was trying to get a handle around what we do, what our company does. And I said, well, you know, a lot of what we do is work with business on figuring out efficiencies in their in their company, and that's always tough when you're talking to some companies because a lot of companies are run by engineers. And engineers are, that's what they learn is about efficiencies. And um, this guy has an engineering background as well. But, you know, I just gave him a couple examples. Like at a mushroom uh, company that we worked in, we went in and did a job analysis of one of the production lines. And, you know, the, the production line, what we saw when we observed it was that, um, you know, there's six people working on this, on this little line that's doing button mushrooms. It's kind of a specialty crop. And so they're, they're filling the mushroom. The mushrooms are coming down a conveyor, and they've got these little boxes, these little flats that unfold, right? And, and they're delivered. You know, what happens is about every 15 minutes, somebody left the line to go get more boxes and bring them back. So that meant that these mushrooms were going by the line, not being packed. And so, you know, now the, the owner of the company was an engineer. He developed all the production lines. And so when I went to see him about what I saw, I said, here's what I saw. And I, I only looked at this line. I didn't look at the 12 other lines you've got going on and your other 150 employees. But here's what I saw on this line. And, and he goes, oh, man. He says, you know, he, he you know, this is, Business gets into the same patterns that all human beings get into, and sometimes they need a set of fresh eyes looking at it. It was a very simple thing, and what we did was we created a position for somebody to make boxes, right? Not a glamorous job by any means, right? But it was a job, and it paid well, and it was a steady work group, and it was natural supports. We didn't have to do any job coaching, so it worked out really, really well. But, you know, that, that, there was an, that was an economic, I didn't have to run numbers for him. I could just say, every 15 minutes, somebody is getting up and going and get, getting boxes and unfolding the boxes for themselves. Why don't you just have a box maker there on the line? And it was, it was instant, you know, and that's a pretty simple you know, a pretty simple. Well, then you have your hand raised, so I'll, I'll um, uh, enable your mic so you can ask a question. You got to make sure the green mic on the top of your screen is turned on.
still not hearing anything from me, so maybe you want to type it in on your on your chat box, and hopefully Carrie can answer the question. So portfolios, my guess is that Ellen Condon is going to talk about portfolios. A lot of us do them. Um, you know, we use pictures from discovery or, or pictures that we've staged of people doing tasks. A lot of times we work with people who don't have a work history, so what's the sense of having a resume? It's just, it's a white piece of paper, right? But people have skills, and so you can illustrate skills in, in pictures of somebody running a bandsaw or mowing the lawn or weeding the, the, the garden or, you know, washing a dog or driving a car or whatever it is. You know, you can take pictures of those, and those pictures you know, they're worth a thousand words, um, you know, and, and we put that together in a logical sense. And uh, again, I'm, I'm sure Ellen will talk about it, um, uh, so, you know, I'm, I won't steal her thunder. And make sure that you ask her about it, because she's done some really, uh, really great yeah, Ellen's portfolios, present, by uh, the way. Just so you know, Ellen's uh, webinar is going to be April 8th from 3 to 4.30, so uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, any other questions for Carrie? Wonderful. Well, Kerry, thanks for your time. Once again, you provided a great uh, overview of uh, job development and how to kind of think about this a little bit differently and think outside of the box a bit. So we appreciate your insights and your expertise. Um, Kerry will be back on April 23rd uh, to explore uh, micro enterprises and self-employment. So please join us um, for that presentation. So thanks again, Kerry. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks, thanks, Tim. I really appreciate it. Yep. Thanks again for joining everybody. We'll hopefully join join us again in April.